Please open your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel 37. For our Old Testament lesson. This is what the Lord did to Ezekiel and how the Lord inspired him to preserve what happened for our welfare. Ezekiel 37, beginning with verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, O son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. Thus far, our Old Testament lesson. Please turn now to Ephesians chapter 2. Our focus this morning begins with verse 4, but I will read from verse 1 for our proper context. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. 
but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Thus far the reading of God's word. Let's pray together. Almighty God and Father, you have the words of eternal life. We come to you. We pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to give us life, to open our eyes to behold your Son more clearly, to love him more earnestly, that with your help, this morning, we might hear him speaking to us. May the words of my mouth, may the thoughts of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. One of our most natural human tendencies is also one of our greatest failings. And that is to take for granted what we already have. We assume and presume upon our past and present experience until that experience might disappear and then suddenly we're caught unawares. And our life is turned upside down, often with disastrous consequences. Who would have thought that the energy capital of the United States, who would have thought that the state of Texas would not have any power at all? And when they lost their power, that wasn't the end of it. There was a loss of heat, there was a loss of light, there was a loss of food, there was a loss of water, the power, the uh, water stations couldn't pump the water. Everybody now has to boil their water even though the power finally has been put back on. One winter storm knocked it out. They had taken their power for granted. It was very cold this morning when I first woke up. I was glad for that power, but I rarely think about it. I just assume when I wake up, it'll be there. This kind of presumption of taking things for granted can happen in human relationships. It can happen in our church life. We take one another for granted. It can happen in our marriages where a spouse will take their spouse for granted, not give the time and attention and energy that is needed in order to cultivate that relationship. We can unwittingly hurt one another and drift away from one another. But this can also happen in our spiritual life as well, where we take God for granted, where we take our salvation for granted. And sometimes we begin to forget that we're saved and what we're saved for. We forget that God is there, that he is alive, that he exists. Don't be deceived like the Texans and think that it can't happen here. It can't. This is a major concern of the Apostle Paul as he writes this letter to the churches in Ephesus and around Ephesus. 
in the surrounding region, he's concerned for the church. And so in chapter 1, he gave his greetings. And then unexpectedly, he burst forth in a very lengthy doxology of praise to God for every spiritual blessing that we've been given in Christ. He directed our attention away from ourselves and put our attention on Christ. And, and while we're filled with thoughts of the blessings we have from Christ, he then offers what is customary to the beginning of a letter, which is a prayer for your recipient. But rather than just a general prayer for their health and well-being, he asks that God would open their eyes, that they would know what they have. In God, that they would know the hope of God's calling, that they would know the riches of our inheritance, that we might know God's power for us who believe. And then he gets so caught up with God's power that he showed us in Christ and, and he speaks of Christ and, and now he's ready to get to his letter. And so he begins with another one of his famous long sentences, only this sentence is all convoluted. As we noted last time, the first seven verses are one sentence in Greek, and he begins with the object of the verb. And you. And he goes on for two and a half verses to explain who we are, the object of whatever verb it is and whatever subject it might be. And it's not in a pretty picture, if you'll remember. He says we're dead in our sins, that we're captive to evil spiritual powers and that we're deserving of God's wrath against our unrighteousness. For all the spiritual blessings that we have, he needs to bring us back down to earth and to remember who we are. It's not until verse 4 that we get the subject of the sentence for which we in our horrible plight were the object. He says, verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. He now is shifting attention away from who we are apart from Christ and who we become if we forget and take Christ for granted and now brings us back to God. But God. He doesn't want you to take your salvation for granted. He doesn't want you to take your relationship with God for granted. He doesn't want you to take God's grace for granted. And so having reminded us who we are and why we need God now, he wants to remind us of the wonder of grace and salvation. That which we don't think about because we're too busy running around with our busy lives. He wants us to remember the wonder that God saves sinners like you and like me. He wants us to see the motive for God's salvation, the mechanics of God's salvation. And finally, the aim of God in saving us. First, the motive for salvation. It's God's love and mercy. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. The reason why God saves anybody is not in the person being saved. It's in God himself. When Moses begged God to reveal himself to Moses as he was leading a very obstinate, rebellious people out of Egypt towards the promised land. In Exodus 34, verse 6, 
We read the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. A God of mercy and a God of love. The foundation for our salvation is God's love. It's not us. It is within God and his love. God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. The Apostle John talks about love in his first letter, chapter 4. And he says in verse 10, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that God loved us. Our salvation begins within the wonderful and mysterious love of God for sinners. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The wonder of salvation is it begins not in us who need him, but it begins in God. We're told later in that same chapter of First John that we love because God first loved us. The motive for our salvation is God's love and mercy. Now, mercy is God's love to the needy and the vulnerable. Grace is God's love to the guilty. But foundational to salvation is God's love and mercy. Salvation emerges from the heart of God, not from the worth of mankind. Because as he's already made clear, we were dead in our transgressions and sin. We were captive to our own passions. We were captive to Satan himself. We were deserving of his wrath. No, our salvation does not come from our worthiness. Our salvation begins with the love of God. And Paul here, in introducing the subject, creates the very sharp contrast between us being dead in sin and then in verse 4, but God being rich in mercy. According to his great love, he's rich in mercy, he's great in his love. The subject finally appears in sharp contrast to we who are the object of the subject which is God. But what's the verb? We have now God being rich in mercy and love, that being the motive for our salvation, and, and we being worthy of his condemnation, his wrath, we being captive to our sins. Paul now reveals the mechanics of our salvation, what God has done in Christ and in joining us to Christ. In verses 5 and 6, he goes on to say, even when we were dead in our trespasses, see, he's going back to get the object again, which is us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God being rich in mercy because of his great love, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What has God done to save us? God made us alive together with Christ. God raised us together with Christ, and he seated us together with Christ in the heavenly realms. That word made alive together with is a compound verb. 
It starts with the verb to make or to do, poieo, to which he adds the verb to live, zao, to which he adds the preposition together with, sun, sun zao poieo, made alive together with. That word didn't exist until Paul wrote it here. It's not found anywhere else in Greek classical literature until after Paul wrote it here. And it's found only one other place in a parallel passage in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. But he's trying to describe what God has done. And again, it's what God has done, not what we've done. God made us alive together with him. And it's such an exciting thought to, to conceive of. He's like a little kid. He can't keep a secret. Those of you that have little kids know at Christmas time, it's very hard. They want to blurt out and tell what the present is that they've just wrapped. They're so excited about it. Now, Paul wants, is eventually going to get to the heart of the gospel that by grace we have been saved. But before he prepares the groundwork, he can't stop. He blurts out here at the end of verse 5. By grace you have been saved. It's so wonderful what God has done. It's like what Ezekiel saw. He looked out and he walked through the valley in the desert. And there were all these dry bones. Sun burned dry. Just laying there in heaps. No signs of life. But then God says, prophesy over the bones. Prophesy. And all of a sudden the bones start to assemble. That would have been more scary than the image of all these dead bones piled up. The pictures from Dachau and Auschwitz are horrible piles of dead bodies. But imagine if you were there and all of a sudden these bones just start rumbling and rattling and, and people start standing up. And then he, God says, prophesy again the breath to animate these new bodies. And he prophesies again, and there's a mighty army. What an amazing thing God does. He's already said we're dead in our transgressions and sins. We're already captive to our own passions and, and to the wickedness of, of Satan and hostile spiritual powers. But God made us alive together with Christ. It's what God has done, not what we've done. The whole focus here is on God being rich in mercy because of his great love. And what does he do with that great mercy and love? He makes us alive. And then he raises us up. And then he seats us with Christ in the heavenly places. Here Paul is drawing our minds back to what he said in his prayer that we might know the greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might. Verses 19 and 20 in chapter 1. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Christ was physically dead. And God exerted his power to raise Christ up into heaven and to see him at his right hand, a place of honor and authority. And now Paul is saying that God has raised us up with him and that he has seated us with him. Where was Christ sitting? He was sitting at the right hand of God. Where was Christ sitting? He was sitting on a throne. 
And now he says, God has made us alive. He's raised us up. And he's seated us all with Christ. John Stott says Paul coins three verbs. In other words, he invents three verbs which take up what God did to Christ. And then by the addition of the prefix sun together with link us to Christ in these events. What excites our amazement, however, is that now Paul is not writing about Christ like he was in chapter 1. He's writing about us. He is affirming not that God quickened, raised, and seated Christ, but that he quickened, raised, and seated us with Christ. And that's why he says, Seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in Christ Jesus goes back and covers all the three main verbs. This is what God has done in salvation. He's made us alive with Christ. He's raised us up with Christ. He has seated us with Christ in the heavenly realms. In Christ Jesus. That's the key to this passage here. That in Christ. God has saved us. It's not something to take for granted. It's our very hope. It's our very life. God has not only done great things. In and through and to his son. But in a greater way, he has linked our destiny with his. These verbs are all in the past tense. They're all looking back at what God did to Jesus and saying that we were there with Christ in Christ. But you see, that's not about us. It has nothing to do at all with anything that I've done. It's not that I have worth that God would have seen. Oh, this is somebody that I should save because they'll be useful to me because they have worth to me. No, it's what God has done, irrespective of who I am. And what is his aim? What is his aim in salvation? In verse 7, he goes on to say, So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. The aim of our salvation is that the glory of God might be revealed in the salvation of sinners. The very sinners that deserve his wrath now are a display of the wonder of the glory of God. He says that in the coming ages, God might show the immeasurable riches of his grace. He might show, he might display. Before we redid and improved the look of our fellowship hall, you might remember that on the three shelves above the coat rack, there used to be all these trophies. We used to participate in the Sunday school basketball league. And we had a very effective and skilled coach in ruling elder Ted Toner. And... We got lots of trophies. A lot of the trophies 
were really the most important ones for Christian character. Our players always play with a respect for the people they were playing against, with respect for one another, and that's shown. Year after year, we'd get that. But we often had winning teams, too. We would have kids coming from other churches wanting to play on our team. And we had that display back there of all these trophies, of how wonderful our basketball program was our Sunday school basketball program, because that's why we did it, to encourage children to participate in Sunday school. But you see what God is saying here, what Paul is saying here, is that you sinners that Christ has died for, you now our God's trophy display of what God has done in saving you. So that in the coming ages, in the times that are coming from now until the end of time, that we might be a display of the glory of God's grace to sinners like we are. That he could take what is broken and cruel and wicked and worthy of damnation and make it into something good and beautiful and glorious. That all of creation might see, as it were, the wonderful work of God in salvation. And he uses the words, the immeasurable riches of his grace. We've seen that word before in the prayer. In chapter 1, verse 19, he wants us to know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. And now he says, we are a picture of the immeasurable riches of his grace. Andrew Lincoln writes, if the raising of Christ from death to sit in the heavenly realms was the supreme demonstration of God's surpassing power, then the raising of believers from spiritual death to sit with Christ in the heavenly realms is the supreme demonstration of God's surpassing grace. There's nothing greater than God's grace when he takes Sinners, broken, lost, defiant, angry, hurting. And he suddenly gives them life. And he raises them up and makes them beautiful by his spirit. And he places them on thrones to rule with Christ. Now, we still wait for the day when we see that happen. But it's already ours because it's in Christ Jesus. What God has done in Christ and through Christ, we have been connected to Christ. He did those things for us on our behalf. That's why he came to earth. He didn't need to assume a body and a human soul for his own well-being. He was already supremely glorious as the eternal son of God. But he came for our sakes to bear our sins, to die in our place so that our sins might be paid for. And that in his rising, because there was no reason for him to die, he might raise us with him. And thus we might rule with him. Forever and ever. Now the reality is now in the heavenly places. Remember the doxology. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And now he's saying sinners. Church people. This is what God has done. It's God's motive. His great love. His rich mercy. It's God's working. God makes alive. God raises up. God sets us. It's not that we somehow claw our way up. 
to the top of Mount Everest and show that we are the king of the hill. No, God raises us up. And it's all of God's glory. For our lives, as he works within us, as he changes us, it can't be explained by human means. Each one of us, apart from Christ's mercy and love, would be destructive of ourselves and others in various ways. By his common grace, none of us is as utterly wicked as we could possibly be. But it is by his grace and his grace alone that, that we have salvation. William Hendrickson's notes that it's not grace nor the riches of his grace, but the immeasurable riches of his grace that are displayed in us, in Christ, in the heavenly realms. We see dimly now, but one day we shall see clearly. The world sees dimly now, indeed, apart from God's work to make alive, they're blind and dead. But we are there. God's display of his surpassing grace to take the dead and make them alive, to take the bruised and bloody and make them beautiful, to take the guilty and make them free. That's what God is doing in his church. And notice that he does it in kindness toward us. It's not just that God has his trophy case and we're just the means to the end. No, he acts in kindness toward us. That word kindness means the quality of being helpful or beneficial to others. God isn't just using us for his glory. He is blessing us and benefiting us to his glory. Isn't God's grace amazing? Isn't it wonderful? It's God from the beginning to the end. We are but the objects of what he does. But because he unites us to Christ, we have been given what Christ has received by the power of God Almighty at work. There is hope for us, friends. Yes, we're in sharp contrast to the God of power, And he starts off this long sentence pretty grimly. But it's in order to set us up to see just how wonderful is God's working. His making alive together with Christ. His raising up together with Christ. His sitting us in heavenly realms together with Christ. It's always together with Christ. It's never apart from Christ. But it is a making alive and raising and seating us with Christ in kindness. In kindness, God cares. God cares. Do you believe that, friends? Have you forgotten the care of God or just trying to struggle through this? The quarantines and the lockdowns and all the hindrances of this pandemic and inconveniences and the loneliness. And had we forgotten the kindness of God? The kindness of God to give us repentance, to raise us up. Dear friends, 
we are God's display case of the greatness and glory of God's grace. And he reminds us that all that that is is because of Christ. Jesus himself gave us this supper. What is this supper about? It's about what Jesus has done for us. But it's more than simply reminding us of what he's done, that his body was broken, that his blood was shed. It's about the fact that we are incorporated into Christ. That as we feed on him, as it were, this is a sign and seal that we are united to Christ. We're not alone. We're not on our own. But everything God has done in Christ, he has done for us. As Paul says in Romans 6, if we've died with Christ, we're raised with Christ. Because it's about Christ and the wonder of his grace. And we are the recipients of his mercy and love. Let us not take God's grace for granted. Let us this day remember and renew our commitment to him, our zeal for him. And if there's anyone here that has never experienced the grace and love and mercy of Christ, the best we can do is point you to Jesus. Why he came to die, not for himself, but for sinners. And what you have to do, there's nothing you can do but receive by faith the wonders of his grace. Dear friends, let us not take God for granted, but let us treasure him, remember him, believe him, and experience even now the foretaste of a glory that is yet to be fully revealed but one day will be clearly seen by the entire creation. Let's pray. Forgive us, Lord, for taking you for granted, for taking our salvation for granted, for forgetting that it's not what we have accomplished that makes us acceptable, but rather it's your mercy and love as you worked in Christ on our behalf. May our hearts thrill to think of Jesus and what you've done in him, your great power that raised him from death, your great grace that raises us even now from death to life. And one day you will raise even our physical bodies from death to life that we might reign with you forever. Oh, forgive our foolish forgetfulness and instead imbue us with your love with your mercy, with your power, that those around us, in looking at us, would see more than us, that they might see Jesus. We pray as Jesus himself taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, we are gathered today
And we draw near to the Lord's table to celebrate the holy communion of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let us gratefully remember why our Lord gave this supper to us. For the perpetual memory of his dying for our sakes. And as a pledge of his undying love for us sinners as a bond of our mystical union with him and through him that we are joined together with one another as one body because of what Jesus has done. This is a seal of his promises to us. They are as real and as certain as the very elements that we touch and taste. God's promise is true. And this reminds us how true it is. Here we have the blessed assurance that Christ himself is here among us as we have gathered in his name. This is his table. He is the one inviting you to come. And what does he offer us? He offers us himself that we might have the privilege of feeding upon him who is the very bread of life, finding nourishment not for our bodies, but for our souls in eternity. This is his pledge that he's coming again for those that he loves. And so we bow before the Father, of whom all creatures in heaven and earth are made, asking that he might renew our hearts by the Holy Spirit, that he would give us life, that Christ himself would dwell in us by faith, and that we might know with all of God's people the boundless reaches of God's love and mercy, that we, though finite and fallible, might be filled with the fullness of the infinite and infallible God. Now, who could understand that? The infinite, infallible love of God somehow filling finite and fallible people. But to him who's able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or even imagine according to his power at work in us. To him there will be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Amen.